Welcome back. This is Dr. Jin Sung, where clinical excellence meets excellent results. Today we're going to talk about intermittent fasting. What is it and what are the benefits of intermittent fasting? So let's get right into it. In very simplistic terms, it's basically consuming fewer or no calories over a time frame, whether that would be 10 hours, 12 hours, 16 hours, etc. Right? Intermittent fasting has been used uh, historically for religious purposes as well as some medical conditions. And then if you look at prehistoric times, we're talking about hunter-gatherers. Right? You would go out, hunt, eat, feast, and then you may go a few days without food. So intermittent fasting has been a historical thing. So what does intermittent fasting do? It shifts your body from using glucose or glycogen to using ketones or fatty acids. So if you look at it, it shifts it into a ketogenic state. It uses fuel called ketones. So body's available glucose and glycogen gets depleted over a time frame that uh, it's going to be individualized. Some people will be in a ketogenic state in 12 hours. Some people will be 24 hours. However, it will deplete it and then you're going to use your fat stores or ketones to drive your systems. So what are some of the benefits of using ketones as fuels, fuel as rather than glucose? So intermittent fasting and benefits, right? There are a lot of them, okay? One is weight loss, right? Also improves body composition. So that's one reason. But it also improves cardiovascular risk. It improves uh, one, inflammation, and two, it can improve your lipid panel, like cholesterol, LDLs, improves HDLs, etc. So um, Another one is it decreases blood pressure or helps to improve blood pressure. Another one is it improves glucose metabolism, the body to utilize glucose more efficiently. Therefore, it improves insulin sensitivity, right? So if you're borderline diabetic, you have hemoglobin A1C of 5.7 to maybe 6. You are insulin resistant. Then you can use a ketogenic diet to improve insulin sensitivity because you're not just feeding your body with glucose, you're able to give it a break and you're using ketones as fuels. Now, it also improves fasting insulin, so your first morning insulin will also improve. Other benefits is that it decreases oxidation, so it can work like an antioxidant, right? So you're not taking in food and you're not processing all that um, carbohydrates and, and, and sugars and etc. So it decreases oxidation, and again, it decreases inflammation. Also, athletes have been using it to improve athletic performance, and not every athlete will do this, or not every athlete will benefit from, from this, but it has been shown to improve athletic imp performance in, in quite a number of uh, people. It will also improve longevity, right? So improve um, uh, basically quality of life longer into um, to advanced ages. Other benefits are it will improve gut microbiome as well as your immune function. So there are a lot of different benefits that come along with intermittent fasting and it's become quite popular in certain populations. So it's important to understand why you would do it, what the benefits are, and in some patients you have to be cautious, right? If you have advanced type 2 diabetes or you have type 1 diabetes, I would suggest you know, using a provider who knows what they're doing to help them guide them through that process, right? Because you want to make sure they're not going to go into um, ketoacidosis, uh, which can be quite dangerous for that person. So it's very important for that patient to understand what's going on with them. So on our next video, we're going to talk about all the different types of intermittent fasting so you can get an idea of what you might fit into your lifestyle and what the benefits you can reap from it. Today we're going to talk about intermittent fasting and the different methods you can utilize to fit into your busy schedule. We'll go right into it 
alternate day fasting. This is when you're eating for 24 hours normally, and then the next 24 hours you may only drink water. So you're abstaining from eating any calories, con any calorie containing beverages and food for every other day, right? Alternate days of fasting. Next one is a modified alternate day fasting. And this is not a true fast because on the day that you're supposed to be fasting, you're, you are actually taking in 20 to 25% of your normal caloric intake. So let's say you have a 2000 calorie diet, then on the day you're fasting, you're only taking in about 500 calories. So it's not a true fast because you, know, you, you are taking some calories in during that day. You have a time restricted feeding window. This is when you eat for a certain time frame during the day, and then you fast the rest of the day. And that window can be anywhere from 4 to 12 hours. So you can vary that up. So you can say, I'm only eating between noon and 4, or 4 and 8 p.m., and then you're going to fast the rest of the time. So you can fast anywhere from 12 to 20 hours for the day. What I find most uh, useful for most patients is a feeding window of 8 hours and a fasting uh, window of 16. So that way you're, let's say you're eating at noon and you can go all the way to 8 o'clock and then you won't eat anything beyond 8 o'clock until the following day at noon. So that's a good way to get patients started in terms of intermittent fasting. I personally use a 8 to 16 window so I will I get off work a little bit later so I get home it's around 7 38 by the time I have dinner so I won't eat till the following day around noon or 12 30 right so I have a window of 16 hours where actually I'm not having any caloric intake all right so there are other methods of feeding where you do early time restricted feeding. So you're gonna pick a time frame, maybe four to six hours that you can eat early in the morning. And that time frame can be anywhere from, let's say 6 a.m. to noon, or 8 a.m. to 2 p.m. You pick the hours early on, and then you fast for the rest of the day, only drinking water. Then you'll have a cycling one, where you have five days on and two days off. So we call it a periodic or cycling fast. You are eating for five days normally, and then you'll fast for two days, drinking only water, okay? Another popular one is six to one, where you're eating normally for six days, and then fasting for one. Now, you can actually use a combination of these, right? So I personally will use the eight to 16 fasting window, and then one day a week, I will fast. Right, so I will do intermittent fasting for six days, eight hours of feeding time, 12 hours off. And then on Mondays, I actually don't eat anything. I drink water, right? And I see patients all day long. And I can get through that without any sluggishness or mental fatigue or anything like that. So it actually helps improve cognitive function. Now, there are other uh, feeding uh, schedules for intermittent fasting. So for someone who has, let's say, chronic inflammatory processes, you can use longer fasts to um, initiate what we call autophagy or autophagy, right? Basically cleaning up debris from your body, the dead cells. So you can go longer, three days, four days, five days, right? It's also helpful for people who have things like Alzheimer's or uh, cognitive decline where you can use that feeding window, a uh, longer uh, fasting window to help clean out uh, the debris, right? So your body is basically uh, not processing any foods, right? And it's focused on um, keeping your uh, cells healthy. So a longer feeding period or fasting period for some people can be quite beneficial. But for longer feeding or fasting windows, you should be monitored, right? because you can go into a hypoglycemic state and you don't realize it, 
you need to kind of gradually work into it or work with a provider who understands what's going on with you. Other patients like hypoglycemic patients where they have uh, tend to have low blood sugar and they get hungry or angry right, or hangry, right? Those types of patients, you have to get them a little bit more keto adaptive or have them have more fats in their diet before they can even do a fast. So you may have to put in more avocados, uh, extra virgin olive oil, coconut oil, and so forth to help build their reserves of fat so they can utilize it before they can even do a fast later on. And their fasting window might be short in the beginning, right? There might be a 12 and 12, right? 12 hours they're eating, 12 hours they're fasting. And then gradually change their uh, ratio uh, to a different level. But hypoglycemic patients need to be careful. Also with intermittent fasting or longer intermittent fasting, if you're a type 2 diabetic who's chronic, or a type 1 diabetic, you have to be very cautious, right? Because those patients can go into ketoacidosis. So they need to be monitored um, before going ahead and doing aggressive uh, intermittent fasting regimens. Today, we're going to talk about the benefits of intermittent fasting. Now, there are a lot of fad diets out there. Um, one that's popular was 600 calories, and you're taking growth hormones uh, to help you lose weight. Most of these diets are short-lived or short-term. If you want to do a dietary plan or a lifestyle change, intermittent fasting might be the right one for you because it changes physiology. It changes it long-term. So when we look at it, in terms of weight loss benefit, it'll change your uh, body contour by you losing fat, right, rather than muscle. And then you can decrease blood pressure as well as your heart rate. So it has a significant impact on your cardiovascular function, right? Glucose management as well as decreasing insulin. So during that intermittent fasting period, you're going to re reduce insulin load. So if you have insulin resistance, dysglycemia or diabetes, prediabetes, right? It can help manage that, right? One, it may reduce the, um, the need for medications, or two, decrease the amount of medications that you are taking. So there's a quite a number of benefits in terms of weight loss, um, in terms of cardiovascular effects and management of glucose. Now, in terms of what we call metabolic switching, it also does a lot of different things, right? It helps to improve energy by increasing mitochondrial function, Right? So it improves mitochondrial biogenesis. Right? It develops new mitochondria. It helps recovery. It helps with cognition and brain function. And that's because when we get to a certain point and we become, let's say, insulin resistant, the brain uses a lot of glucose to function. That's why when people study for long periods of time, they get hungry because the brain is very biologically active uses a lot of glucose and oxygen. So if you go into what we call metabolic switching, you're using ketones as fuel rather than sugar. Therefore, your brain function or cognition can improve because now it is using a different fuel uh, for the brain rather than sugar. It also has tumor uh, suppression uh, effects. So it helps to improve cancer prevention. It's a great um, added benefit there. Uh, cancer rates are through the roof. Decreasing neurodegeneration. So it's very, very beneficial also for people who have early onset Alzheimer's, uh, Parkinsonisms, um, or degenerative changes, or even people who have um, post-concussion syndromes and so forth. With post-concussion syndromes, you do have to be careful because some of those patients become hypoglycemic. So you have to take them into different phases of care before you go and have them intermittent fast. Improves antioxidant production. What a great benefit. Antioxidants are protective, right? It protects your heart, it protects your vasculature, it pr protects your brain, it protects your cells from damage. So antioxidant effects are quite beneficial here. And the other one is it decreases inflammation. 
Decreasing inflammation also has an added cardiovascular effect, as well as improving overall functions in the cell. Because when you have inflammation, you retain water, uh, your body has a um, heightened immune response. So inflammatory processes uh, can create chronic health conditions. Therefore, by decreasing inflammation, you can have the added benefit uh, of cardiovascular benefits and cellular function and so forth. So there's a lot of benefits that come along with intermittent fasting. And it might be a good idea to look into it and see if it's right for you. You can go back and watch a couple of the other videos I've made on intermittent fasting that explains uh, time intervals and so forth and how to do it. So uh, on my next video, we're going to talk about the exact physiology of how this might work, uh, intermittent fasting, and how it uh, uh, impacts gene expression and protein synthesis. Today we're going to talk about intermittent fasting and the impact it has on cellular function. We often talk about the different impacts and benefits of intermittent fasting, but how does it all work at the cellular level? So let's get into some of the physiology, right? Intermittent fasting basically activates certain proteins that regulate cellular function. So there's a protein called FOXO, and this is the protein that will help suppress tumors. So it has tumor suppression action, therefore minimizing or uh, improving uh, can cancer outcome, right? PGC1-alpha. This is where the energy is produced, right? We're talking about mitochondrial biogenesis. It actually uh, creates more mitochondria, improving cellular energy. And it's also remodeling of tissues. So there is a process called autophagy or autophagy, where there's going to be cleaning up of cellular debris, right, in our body. And it's a great way to remodel some of our tissue. And it also, um, it's a metabolism regulation um, uh, protein. So it improves um, a calorie burning uh, capabilities, basically improves that sluggish uh, body where you feel tired all the time. So you have more energy, you have more mitochondria, and more function. NRF2. This is the protein that helps reduce inflammation, right? It's anti-inflammatory effects. So it helps cardiovascular function, uh, reduces water retention, uh, reduces chronic disease, and so forth, because you're minimizing inflammatory processes in our body. The other one is activates kinases that modulate gene expression. So this is where we have genetic expression that can be altered because you are intermittent fasting. So there is AMPK kinase, and this is the one that regulates energy. And it's also responsible for repair and recovery. So after injury, right, you want this to be upregulated so you can repair and recover or with chronic disease, or any acute inflammatory processes. You want to be able to regulate your energy and then repair and recover from that injury. CERT genes, right? It turns on genes for stress resistance and myo mitochondrial biogenesis. Again, another gene that improves energy, right? So it has a great impact on your, let's say, fatigue. I'm tired all the time. I eat and I fall asleep. It improves insulin resistance. It improves uh, mitochondrial function for ATP production. So when we look at intermittent fasting and we go, oh wow, there's all these benefits, but how does it really work? It works by stimulating protein synthesis, right? And then it also impacts gene expression uh, and also improves Bio, uh, mitochondrial biogenesis. So it has many impacts. So if you have never tried intermittent fasting and you have chronic health conditions, uh, you might want to consider and look at some of the intermittent fasting intervals to see which one might fit well into your um, daily life, as well as a ketogenic diet. So using ketogenic diets along with intermittent fasting 
can have a profound impact on your overall health. Today we're going to talk about intermittent fasting and cleaning up the body. So let's get right into it. Intermittent fasting and cleaning up the body. The process of autophagy or autophagy or mitophagy or mitophagy. Intermittent fasting, what does it do? So there is something called protein aggregates. And if you do intermittent fasting, you can increase the breakdown of these protein aggregates called autophagy. So during the fasting phases, it helps to clear out these protein aggregates. Aggregates like amyloid and tau associated with Alzheimer's, alpha synuclein associated with Parkinson's, and Lewy body dementia. So when you're looking at it, <clears throat> the autophagy really impacts the brain. And neurons become much more efficient during the fasting phases. And it will help decrease inflammation or neuroinflammation. The other process of autophagy is it cleans out prime glial cells. Glia is the basically the immune system or the glue of the brain. And it has a role in many different things. One of the things that can happen is when you have traumatic brain injury or significant post-traumatic stress, you can prime the microglia of the brain. It turns on these immune cells in the brain and creates havoc around the tissues where it's turned on. So when we look at glial cells that are primed, you want to be able to clear that out. And that's the process of autophagy also. And then that in itself will decrease inflammation. So it cleans out uh, immune cells that are uh, hyperactive, and it cleans out protein aggregates that affect brain function, and then decreasing neuroinflammation altogether. Now, intermittent fasting will also create um, improvement in damaged mitochondria. So it will clean out mitochondria, which is basically the powerhouse of the cells that produce ATP. So the damaged mitochondria increases mitophagy from fasting and clears out damaged mitochondria from the cell. It promotes mitochondrial efficiency. So you're just getting rid of those mitochondria that are damaged, not producing enough ATP uh, to provide energy for the cell. So you're trying to improve mitochondrial function overall. It will increase cellular ATP and then increases cell function altogether, thereby also decreasing neuroinflammation. So the process of intermittent fasting can have a profound effect on how the brain can function and decrease intermittent uh, neuroinflammation. Now, if I've done other videos on intermittent fasting, so you might want to go ahead and watch those because uh, there are a lot, there's a lot of information out there about intermittent fasting and how it can be good for you. What I'm trying to teach you here is the, the process that occurs when you actually do the intermittent fasting and how it, a, a profound in, impact you can have uh, on your body if you can catch it early enough. So if you can catch Alzheimer's or, or uh, Parkinson's disease early on and you start implementing a ketogenic diet, intermittent fasting, you can have a profound effect without any really taking any nutrients or supplements, you can have a profound effect just on dietary intake alone. Today we're going to talk about the three-day water fast. Clean the brain, reset your energy. Let's get into some of the benefits and what happens during the three days. Let's get right into it. Benefits. Improves immune function, repairs damage to cells, removes dysfunctional cells, and pathogens, reduces neuroinflammation, or basically things like prime glial cells, increase autophagy, breaks down cells and other pathogens in our system, decreases autoimmune disease, benefits gut flora or resets the gut flora, and increases DNA repair. Okay, so there's a lot of benefits to a three-day fast. Now, if you want to do the three-day fast, I would suggest consulting a physician, especially if you have insulin-dependent diabetics, right? Because if you go on a fast and you continue to take your insulin, it's going to be problematic. 
People who are menstruating, I suggest not doing a three-day fast during menstruation because it could really deplete you. Hypoglycemics, people who go without eating, get shaky, irritable, um, angry, right? Those are the people who do not want to do a three-day fast immediately. They need to get into more of a keto adaptive state uh, before going on a three-day fast. People who are on a lot of different medications, because medications uh, can change or dosages can change uh, related to how much you're eating and uh, depletion of energy. So just make sure if you have any of these conditions, please consult your physician before going ahead and doing a three-day fast. So let's get into some of the things that happen during a three-day fast. So eight to 12 hours, what's gonna happen is you're gonna to start to deplete your glucose or sugar and your glycogen stores, right? It'll decrease that. You're gonna have a bump in uh, hormones called glucagon, human growth hormones, cortisol, and adrenaline. These are the things that will start to bump up your uh, glucose levels. So people don't realize that there are hormones that increase glucose in our system as we need it. And there's one hormone called insulin that brings uh, glucose down in our system. So it's really four to one, four hormones to one in terms of regulating uh, blood sugar. You will also increase ketones from fats. So as you deplete your glucose stores or glycogen stores, your body will start to use fat for fuel and it will produce something called ketones uh, to fuel your body you also will start to experience hunger, all right? So in the next 18 to 24 hours there, you're gonna have a depletion of the glycogen stores even further, and you're gonna go through a process called gluconeogenesis. Gluconeogenesis is the process of producing sugar through the liver. Uh, it's basically uh, amino acid, acetate, and glycols. So you can use that uh, to fuel your body. Your body will have a natural mechanism to fuel itself. Further increase in autophagy. Autophagy is when you uh, have cellular debris, uh, things that are in your system that are kind of old and broken down. It'll start to kind of clean those things out of our system. It will also start to decrease autoimmunity because a lot of autoimmune conditions are related to food proteins. So if you have things that you're eating and it's causing inflammatory responses, the fact that you're on a fast will start to decrease that autoimmune process. It'll decrease neural inflammation. So when your body is used to using glucose, especially in the brain, uh, it can cause some inflammatory process, processes. When you switch your fuel from glucose to ketones, your brain will start to become a hybrid. So it will start to use ketones for fuel rather than glucose, and it will start to decrease inflammation. I have a separate video on this, so I'll link that below. It will also increase hormones called brain-derived neurotrophic factors and human growth hormones. And you'll start to see ketones in your blood. So what you can do is you can buy a little um, ketone meter uh, you just cut, it's like a, a glucose test. You just prick your finger and you can check your level of ketones. And in the first 18 to 24 hours, you're going to see 0.5 to maybe one in terms of the ketone levels. Now, everyone's different in terms of how fast they can go into ketosis. If, if you're someone who's very experienced and you do intermittent fasting and you're on a ketogenic diet, you're going to get into ketosis a little bit quicker. Day two you're gonna to continue to increase brain-derived neurotropic factors as well as growth hormones. You're gonna increase autophagy, and this is where the real cleanup starts to occur in day two. You'll start to break down tau proteins and uh, amyloids, Lewy body, alpha synucleins, and prime glial cells, all in the brain. These are all related to things like post-traumatic stress, uh, concussions, uh, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, Lewy body dementia. So it starts to break down these uh, aggregates in our brain and, and it, it clears it out. There's a process called mitophagy. 
it'll start to uh, get rid of inefficient mitochondria in our, in our cells. So mitochondria produces energy, ATP, and you want mitochondria to be very efficient and produce the number of ATPs that it's supposed to, and it'll start to get rid of things that are damaged and get it out of our system, okay? Your insulin resistance starts to come down. So people who are pre-diabetic, diabetic, your insulin resistance or the problem of um, not enough uh, glu glucose transport will start to break, right? So insulin resistance will start to uh, improve. It'll decrease fatty liver. And the reason is because you're using fat for fuel and part of that fat will come from the liver. So fatty liver uh, will start to break down and you can clear fatty liver if it's not too far advanced. 90 to 95 percent of your energy will start coming from ketones in day two, right? Instead of glucose because you haven't eaten. And your hunger pains will start to actually subside in day two. For a lot of people, they go, I don't really feel hungry. I feel actually pretty good, right? Day three, continued autophagy and clearance, reversal of real chronic disease. So people who have um, chronic autoimmune disease, chronic fatigue, a lot of issues with um, uh, joint pain, those types of things, will start to clear to a certain extent. It will increase your immune function. Right, So your immune function will start to um, reset and improve and there will be an improvement in overall function of the white blood cells. You'll also have increase in stem cells, right? The stem cells will differentiate into other tissues. So the stem cells will actually help you heal. Now, the goal of this three-day fast is what we call metabolic flexibility or metabolic switch the ability for your body to use both glucose and ketones whenever it wants. So if you are someone uh, who eats every day, three, four, five, six, seven, eight times a day, what happens is you're using insulin mostly, right? Because you never let the sugar drop, right? So you get this wild fluctuation. So you have spike in sugar, spike in insulin, drop in sugar, drop in insulin. So you get this while swing. The purpose of a three-day fast or any type of fasting is to even out the blood sugar throughout the day. So if you eat, let's say, what we call one meal a day, you'll have a, a spike in, in uh, insulin and then you'll have a drop and your other hormones will kick in like glucagon, um, growth hormones, uh, adrenaline, etc will kick in and will stabilize the blood sugar for the rest of the day. So that's what we want. We want stable blood sugar throughout the day, not this wild fluctuation. So as you do this uh, intermittent fasting or three-day fasting, there'll be a lot of health benefits. But the main point here is that it will start to stabilize blood sugar and your body will become a hybrid, meaning when it has the sugar, it'll utilize it. If it doesn't have it and you skip a day of, of eating, then it will start to use ketones as fuels. Uh, so it'll, it, your engine becomes more of a uh, hybrid engine rather than a gasoline engine. So it's very important to do that. Now, when you break your fast, you don't wanna just go ahead and, and just say, all right, I'm just gonna eat whatever I want. You wanna use things like maybe bone broth, uh, a vegetable soup uh, to break your fast, uh, maybe a small amount of protein. When you're doing the fast, you can use distilled water if you like, or you know, purified water would be best. You can use minerals and sea salt, especially on day two, maybe uh, 24 to 48 hours. You wanna start to use a little bit of minerals because you might feel a little bit depleted. So you can use minerals or sea salt uh, in your water and you can drink it. And then uh, you can also use sparkling, sparkling water, but not flavored water because what can happen with flavored water, you can start to uh, increase hunger pain, uh, pains in our system. Now, for those people who can't get through a three-day fast, I'm going to show you a method of doing uh, a three-day uh, modified fast on our next video. So we'll talk about how to do it without doing strictly water uh, for the three days. All right. So these are all the benefits. This is what happens. I have multiple videos on intermittent fasting, so I'll link those below. And what you want to do is if you ever go through it, 
uh, comment below. Let me know how you felt during the three-day fast and what the benefits of the three-day fast were for you. Now, when you do a three-day fast, uh, there's wide benefits. However, you have to be careful about some of those conditions that I talked about in the beginning of the video, um, and you want to consi uh, consult the physician before doing it. The three-day water fast video has generated a lot of interest and a lot of different questions. So what we're going to do today is answer some of those questions that are listed in the comments below. So let's get right into it. The three-day water fast, questions and answers. First of all, it's not a fast from water. It is a fast from food. You are allowed to drink water during the three days, okay? So what type of water should we drink? You can do spring water, preferably from glass. You can do reverse osmosis or distilled water, but you definitely want to add in minerals to that water. How much water should we drink? That can be subjective. You want to drink so you're not thirsty. However, if you want some more precise numbers, you can do half of your body weight in ounces of water. So if I weigh 100 pounds, you want to drink about 50 ounces of water per day, okay, along with the electrolytes mixed in. What to put in the water? You can put in sea salt, Himalayan pink salt, or you can get these electrolyte packets with you know, sodium and potassium, magnesium, etc. So you can get those electrolyte packets and you could put it into uh, the water, okay? So if you had like 16 ounces of water, you take a pinch of Himalayan pink salt and you put it in there. You don't need huge amounts, but you definitely want some mineralization. So can I drink black coffee and green tea? Yes, you can. I prefer the patient not drink green tea or coffee, just because you want to just give your body a complete break, okay? So you can, uh, the caffeine and the, the black coffee or, or green tea will impact insulin ever so slightly. So I prefer not to, but will it break the fast? No. Can I exercise? Yes, you can. So on the first day of the fast, you can probably do your normal exercise, your normal exercise routine, unless you're like an ultra athlete and you're running miles and miles and miles, uh, or an MMA athlete who trains two or three times a day. Uh, you do have to be careful with that. But on day one, for normal people, you can do your normal exercises. Days two and three, you probably won't do those exercises, and you can do some light stretching, take a, a walk, um, do light calisthenics maybe, but you definitely want to take it easy on days two and three. Why do I get migraines? Well, it depends on the individual, right? So I preface my videos and say that you should consult your physician. And the reason I say that is because I don't know you. I don't know what condition you're in. So if you have issues, you do need to consult with the physician so you don't get into trouble. So why do you get migraines? It could be hypoglycemia, where you have low blood sugar. How do we know if you have low blood sugar? Look at some signs and symptoms, right? If you miss, skip a meal or miss a meal, or if you go too long between meals, you get irritable, angry, shaky, hangry, or hungry and angry, right? Once you eat, you feel much better. Your energy returns, right? Those are the people who have hypoglycemia. Those patients should not go straight into a three-day water fast. They should do more of a high-quality protein fat meal and get their body more keto-adaptive before attempting to do any type of fasting. So they have to eat regularly, high-quality protein fats and veggies, get their body more used to it, eliminate those uh, simple carbs out of their diet. And then once they're feeling much better with that, then they should do maybe intermittent fasting, 18, um, uh, 16 and eight, and eight. So you eat during an eight hour window and fast for 16. And they should build slowly to a three day water fast. They should never jump into a three day water fast. They will crash and burn. Okay, so hypoglycemics will get those headaches, okay? Electrolyte imbalances or people who are malnourished going into a three-day water fast, right, will have issues with headaches. 
Sometimes it's just simple carbohydrate withdrawal. So you're used to eating a lot of carbs and pizza and sandwiches and all this stuff. And then when you don't have it, you can develop a headache. You're actually getting a withdrawal symptom related to these carbohydrates. Could you take a multivitamin? Yes and no. So will it break the fast? No. But there are some instances where if you take multivitamins, you don't get into full autophagy. So what you want to do is just keep it simple, water and electrolytes, right? And then if you must, you can have coffee and green tea, okay? And if you must, then you can have a multivitamin or antioxidants and those types of things. But the, in the simplest form, it should just be water and electrolytes. Okay. Who shouldn't do a three-day water fast? Like I said, hypoglycemics and the reasons why. Insulin-dependent diabetics. The reason is you, I can't monitor your blood sugar, so you need to monitor it, or you need a professional who can monitor your blood sugar and advise you. Um, so a supervised three-day water fast is much better for someone who has insulin-dependent diabetes. People who are pregnant, people who are people. So I said people uh, in my video on my three-day water fast. And the reason I said it is just because this is a one-take video. I do not do any edits. I start and I finish and I upload. So I might say people, person, women, men, right? So it's just a mistake. So when I say pregnant, I'm talking about women. Breastfeeding, women. Malnourished people should not do it. Not just women. Anyone who's malnourished. Alcoholics, anorexics should not do it. Menstruating, women. Okay? I'm making fun because I got so much slack on the comments about saying people menstruating. So, I have gastritis or I have stomach issues or I have GERD. You should do a gut healing protocol first not do just a three-day water fast. Because when what happens is if your stomach goes empty, some people, it irritates their stomach. So they should do some sort of gut healing protocol. I have a video on that. I'll link that in the description below. How do I break the fast? So when you're in a fast, you're basically in ketosis, right? So a good way to break it is with fats, like an MCT oil, right? maybe followed by a sliver of avocado. And then you can build to a bone broth or vegetable broth. And this is within a progression within a day, right? So you might just do that, wait an hour or two, do bone broth or vegetable broth, wait a little bit, and then come around lunchtime, you can do some fermented foods like sauerkraut, okay? Cook vegetables thereafter, right? You definitely wanna cook them, you don't wanna do them raw. Okay, once you can do that, maybe towards maybe 10 or 12 hours, you can start doing a little bit of animal protein. The key here is on the first day, do small portions. Your body's not used to taking in the food and processing it all. So you want to go slow and steady on the first day, but that's how you could break a fast, okay, in that order, really. Um, there is a, a problem with some people who are malnourished or fasting for 7, 8, 10, 15 days uh, with uh, refe refeeding syndromes. So you can look that up, but you don't want to go aggressively with eating. And you, you want to avoid uh, simple carbs, especially when you break a fast. You don't want to do like a greasy hamburger, uh, all those types of things. Next level, you want to do things like belly breathing during the fast. You can do alternate nostril breathing during the fast. Meditation, that really can take you to another level uh, in terms of how you feel at coming out of a fast, all right? So answer a bunch of questions. I know there's gonna be more questions, so you can uh, ask those questions below, and I'll try to make another video to try to answer all those questions. There's a lot of good resources about breaking fast and fasting and so forth. Uh, one of the leading authorities really is Jason Fung. Uh, look up his video and he's got some great information there. Um, but at the end of the day, 
you have to do what's right for you. You don't have to go into a straight three-day fast. You can start with intermittent fasting, right? High quality foods, etc. Then you can try one meal a day or OMED. And then you can do maybe one full day fast, two day fast, and a three day fast. Don't jump into a three day fast if you're not ready. Okay? So if you're working, and let's say you're a construction worker, but you're pretty lean and, 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 and muscular, right? Sometimes you're not going to do well on a three day fast, if, especially if you're going to go ahead and work uh, in a construction site. So be smart, be careful. And then if you need a nap during the day, take a nap. Uh, you might want to start the fast on a Friday, go carry it through the weekend until Sunday. That way you're not um, having to work strenuously or you have the flexibility to take time off or, or take a nap or rest or whatever you want to do. Today we're going to talk about the lemon lime green tea fast, the alternative to the three day water fast. So let's get right into it. The purpose of this is to unwind the gastrointestinal, neuroendocrine, immune system imbalance. Basically, we're going to reset the gut. We're going to help reset the hormones as well as the immune system. So in order to do this fast, we're going to use one gallon of distilled water. You're going to boil it and then you're going to put four decaf green tea bags, naturally decaffeinated green tea bags and you're gonna seep it into the water for about four minutes. Then you're gonna utilize a grade B maple syrup, usually about two to four uh, tablespoons per gallon is about right, but you're gonna use that for taste, right? You're gonna use it to get rid of some of the tartness of the lemon and lime. For the lime, you're gonna use three fresh squeezed limes. You can use the pulp in there and then uh, three fresh squeezed lemon, all, including the pulp also, all right? And the purpose of this is you're going to sip it or drink every 10 to 15 minutes. So you can take a nice uh, gulp of, uh, of the mix every 10 to 15 minutes. I suggest using a timer so you know you have to drink it. The reason we need to do this is because we want to stabilize blood sugar for the entire day. So we don't want to have drops in blood sugar, too uh, much of a spike in blood sugar. So we're going to try to stabilize it by just giving small amounts that your body can tolerate uh, every 10 to 15 minutes. All right. So that's very important. Now, what is the purpose of having lemon lime in there? Well, most people who have chronic disease or metabolic syndrome, diabetes, or some sort of autoimmune disease, because they're chronically sick and inflamed, they tend to be acidic, right? So lemon-lime juice will alkalize the body. So there's an alkalizing effect. Number two, maple syrup. So a lot of diabetics or metabolic pa patients may have unstable blood sugar and they just can't control it, right? They need sugar to maintain their normal physiology. So what you're going to do is you're going to give them a very small, steady dose of maple syrup, right, to maintain that physiology. And again, it's very important to do it every 10 to 15 minutes. So again, set a timer. The green tea improves serum triglyceride and the liver function and liver lipids. It's also an antioxidant. Now the green tea is not necessary, but it's a nice adjunct to this um, um, serum. Okay, so the whole purpose of the lemon lime green tea fast is to stabilize the blood sugar, decrease the antigenic load, meaning the food proteins, and then reset the GI, neuroendocrine, and immune system. Now you can do this fast up to three days or longer, right? Three days is when you really get the benefits of all the things that you're doing in terms of fasting. So three days would be actually the minimum and you could go up to four, five, six days on this type of regimen because you're getting a small load of glucose uh, throughout the day. 
So when you get to the three-day period, you have to ask yourself, how am I feeling, right? Do I really need to break this fast? Or can I continue? So some people will go, I feel wonderful, I'm gonna to go to day four, still feeling great, I'm gonna to go to day five, okay? Again, it's important that uh, you meet with the physician who understands how to do this um, so your blood sugar doesn't drop and you have issues. Now, if you're going to do this for three days and you really can't tolerate it, let's say day two comes and you go, I have to eat, I just can't stand it any longer. What you can do is steam Brussels sprouts or kale without any seasoning and you just eat a little bit of that to see if you can curb your appetite and get through or, or over that hump um, and see if you can maintain that and continue on to day three, all right? So that's a great way if you cannot do a three-day water fast is to do a three to five day lemon lime green tea fast. Fasting increases this good bacteria. What is it, what does it do? And why is it important to have proper levels of this bacteria in our gut? Let's get right into it. Fasting increases this good bacteria. The name of the bacteria is called Acromancia municifilia. We'll call it AM for short. And it was discovered in 2004. Okay? It's one of 20 uh, most common bacteria found in our gut, and it comprises three to five percent of the gut population of the microflora. Okay? AM lives in the mucus layer of the gut lining, and the mucus layer is what protects the epithelial cells of the gut lining. The epithelial cells are only one cell thick, so the mucus is very important for protection against foreign toxins getting into our body. AM feeds on the gut mucus layer and produces short-chain fatty acids as well as nutrients, okay? And the short-chain fatty acids help to produce more mucus. So it's a commensal bacteria and the short-chain fatty acids increases production of new mucus. So it degrades the mucus and helps to produce new mucus, keeping it fresh and um, a, a protective barrier uh, from the gut lining into the body, all right? Low AM weakens the gut barrier, allowing toxins to cross. This is the classic example of what they call leaky gut, intestinal permeability, or gut dysbiosis, okay? So benefits of having proper levels of AM is it improves uh, atophy, things like allergies, asthma, eczema, helps with autism, irritable bowel disease or irritable bowel uh, syndromes, Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, obesity, and type two diabetes. It improves blood sugar levels, reduces gut inflammation, and helps to improve insulin sensitivity, okay? I'll step away from the board so you can see it. So how do we increase Acromancia, okay? One is intermittent fasting. You can do what we call time-restricted fasting or alternate day fasting, where you eat one day, fast for one day, eat one day, fast for one day, right? You can do alternating. I've made a couple of videos on these, so I'll link those below, okay? So you can increase acromancia uh, and overall positive effects of the gut flora by doing intermittent fasting. People with higher levels of AM have better results when they actually do calorie restriction diets or intermittent fasting or alternate day fasting, right? Or time restricted eating. So having higher levels also benefits in speeding up the metabolism and insulin sensitivity. You can do supplements. There's a company called Pendulum that makes the acromancia, okay? You can also do cranberry or things that are high in polyphenols, things like berries, uh, the peels of apples. You can also do rhubarb uh, extract. 
green tea is also great for that. And then using other prebiotics as well as probiotics may help increase uh, AM. So these are different strategies you can utilize to help improve this important gut flora. Again, it's very important for managing things like dysbiosis, uh, things like type 2 diabetes, uh, metabolic syndrome, and preventing intestinal permeability. So it's an important um, probiotic uh, that people don't really talk about, and it was really discovered recently in 2004. So take a look into it. My name is Dr. Jin Sung, where clinical excellence meets excellent results, and we'll see you guys next week on the healthy side. Have an awesome day.